go. Well, Mr. David Tacey, welcome to the My Mate podcast. Thank you, Tom. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, guys, for everyone listening, I came across David. Um, I read one of his books. He's got a fair few books, actually, <laughs> which we'll find out about. But uh, How to Read Jung. I think um, I speak a lot about Carl Jung on the show. Um, I've got a bit of a background in counselling and um, I love Jungian psychology. But how did you come across um, Jung, David? Well, I came across Jung long before you were born. <laughs> um, and uh, I think I first I was attending a tutorial at uh, Flinders University, which was my first university in Adelaide, and one of the students referred to Jung. And I thought by the sound of the name, he must have been an ancient Chinese philosopher. <laughs> he uh, kind of was. <laughs> and kind of was. Um, so I, I thought to myself, God, that bloke Jung, if he's Chinese or whatever, sounds interesting. And then I discovered he was Swiss German and, um, and uh, started reading his work. So that would have been 1973 mm. when I first started reading him. But I ran into difficulty because um, the university staff weren't interested in Jung at all. Um, he was banished. He's, he's always been banished from the university because he's considered to be, uh, you know, sort of too philosophical for the scientists and too scientific for the philosophers. So yeah. he kind of falls between two stools. And um, the university system, which, uh, you know, is about knowledge, it's not actually about wisdom. That's the problem with it. Otherwise, we'd have a much wiser society. And the whole education system is only based on the intellect. It's not based, for instance, on intuition or gut feeling or emotion or any of those things that are hugely important in discerning human reality. And so I basically had to teach myself. You know, there was no one prepared to teach it to me. And eventually I moved to the United States where Jung has made uh, much more um, inroads into the mainstream culture there than it has here. And uh, so I stayed there a few years and found out more about Jung over there. I worked with a fellow called James Hillman, who was one of Jung's followers. And we, uh, we were in Dallas, Texas. So I spent three years in in Texas, trying to find out more about Jung. Mm. Mm. That's yeah. It's, it's interesting that I think your point's really valid that um, he's too uh, mystical and he's too much of an occultist for the, for the science school. Um, yeah. But he's, um, you know, mm. and, and vice versa. What specifically about his work um, did you resonate with? Because I feel like for people that do grasp some of his work and teachings, the way he writes has a very profound personal meaning. I was wondering if that was the same as you. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, what I find most attractive about Jung is that he puts uh, a lot of the ancient truths into a new psychological language. So it wasn't really, see, I was brought up Christian, but like a lot of people, I threw it away by the time I was about 14. And um, so after reading Jung for a few years, in my mid-20s, I started to realise what religion was all about. But it was only because Jung had helped to translate religion for me into psychological language. Not that he was trying to reduce religion to psychology, but I put it this way. It's like he was trying to um, build a bridge between how we think today and how people thought two and 3,000 years ago. And that mm. bridge is, is very important. And actually without that bridge, uh, people no, don't get to religion at all. And, and that's why I think um, uh, religion is collapsing. At a, at a ferocious rate in in Western societies uh, like Australia and New Zealand, um, and uh, 
Jung is there, but he, even the religious people don't like him because yeah. uh, he he is putting in forward a psychological language that they find it hard to accept. So, you know, I've often tried to help religious people and churches and synagogues and temples and, to understand religion psychologically, but they don't seem to want to do so. Mm. So, you know, there's a refusal to really understand what he's on about. But at the grassroots mm. level, I think he has quite a significant following, actually. You it's know, it's interesting. Yeah. Sorry to cut you off, David, but he really does. And, you know, I'm 27 now um, and more and more people, I might be in a bubble, but more and more people are starting to become more interested with, uh, you know, even something as superficial as comparative mythology, comparative religion, because if you yeah. just take that element, I was very similar to you. I, you know, um, flew my wings out of the um, Christian upbringing and then yeah. um, became an atheist. And there was a lot of fear attached to that. You know, that was a belief system because I was so afraid of going to hell. And then when I started opening up a little bit more and seeing religion for what it was and comparing different religions, you can tell why I'm so interested in this guy because he just viewed it as a very important belief system like other belief systems. Mm. One, one of the reasons why I think Jung speaks to us today is that he was greatly influenced by the East. Um, he went to the East. He studied Eastern scriptures and texts. Uh, he studied Buddhism. He studied Hinduism. And uh, he studied a bit of Islam. And um, he... Um, helps us become uh, familiar with the East without necessarily turning fully fledged to the East. So in other words, he brings the East to the West and, and provides the missing link, mm. uh, which is both psychology and mysticism. So mysticism is really the, the personal experience of the sacred and that's what people want today. They don't want just mm. sermons and texts and, uh, you know, lectures and things like that. They want to feel something about what's sacred. And Jung is very helpful in helping us feel the sacredness of the world we live in, of nature in particular. So he was very interested in ecology and the sacredness of, um, uh, of, of human relationships so he brings it all back to a kind of a back to earth, to, to grassroots. And, and that, I think, not many people have done that. And, mm -hmm. uh, but you don't get too much, uh, too many you know, academics and intellectuals uh, thanking you for that kind of work. So he's been bashed uh, more often than he's been praised, I think. Mm. Yeah. What do some of his um, critics say? you know, like to, to, you know, give them a voice and be open-minded. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, he, he gets criticized from many sides. It depends what kind of critics you, you're referring to, but um, Freudians don't like him because mm. he's seen as the naughty uh, boy of the Freudian movement. Um, Freud loved him for the first few years, the first seven years. And then when Jung started to think for himself, and uh, he'd go beyond Freud, go into a, a deeper area that he called the collective unconscious. Freud wouldn't have a bar of the collective unconscious, um, and uh, he kicked Jung out. And the Freudians mm. have been kicking Jung and Jungians out ever since. Um, so um, Freud wanted to be, you know, number one in the psychoanalytic world, and and he was. As I said earlier, he wanted Jung to be his um, successor. He called Jung his crown prince, but mm. uh, he quickly took the crown off his head when Jung showed signs of becoming interested in mysticism, ancient religions and uh, mythologies, not just as uh, ancient um, systems or archaic ways of thinking, but as, as things that are really useful for us to know about today. And Freud didn't like that aspect of Jung. <clears throat> so that's what, it, mm, mm. that's what happened from the Freudian side. Then uh, the philosophers didn't like Jung because he seemed to be gate-crashing their party. <laughs> um, see, 
like like me, uh, Jung wasn't trained in philosophy. I'm not either. And um, philosophers only accept people who have done the orthodox training and gone all through the uh, through the right channels uh, to become a philosopher. Jung was a philosopher, let's say, by instinct rather than mm. by educational training. You know, he had an instinct for philosophy and he knew that um, uh, psychology itself had to extend beyond the borders of science into the philosophical realms. And so the philosophers said, no, you know, you're not coming into our, our area. You can stay where you are. So he was pushed from pillar to post. The psychoanalysts didn't want him. The philosophers didn't want him. And as I said before, the religious uh, groups didn't want him. The Vatican goes bananas about you know, um, the um, previous pope, Pope John Paul II, wrote a, a script, uh, an edict, condemning Jung and Jungians um, <laughs> for being what he called terrible Gnostics. Um, uh, Gnostics comes from the word, uh, the Greek word for knowledge, meaning gnosis, from which we get our English word knowledge. And um, Jung was a bit of a Gnostic, and it's true that the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches too dislike Gnostics because Gnostics say, no, it's not enough just to hear about God or to be told about religion we want to know God for ourselves. We want to experience God or mm. else we're not interested at all. And that's Gnosticism has been going on in the East and West for a long time, pretty much, you know, since the dawn of time. Mm. So Jung was a sort of a Gnostic influence, but the churches don't like it because it undermines their authority. Mm. They think mm. that if every person, has uh, the right to experience God, then then they feel completely undermined by that. And, mm. um, you know, so it's a very much a power and authority issue. And um, so Jung wasn't interested in worshipping Jesus. He was more interested in following him. Yeah. Um, the churches worship Jesus and uh, on a, you know, on a pedestal which is also the cross. But Jung said, no, if you want to be a Christian, you've got to follow Jesus and become Christ-like in your own life, and that's too threatening. The churches don't want you to do that. They just want you to sit in the pews and listen to what you've told and to accept it. So it's far too radical for their, uh, for their liking. Mm. And, uh, but, you know, people like me uh, who had already fallen out of the church, as I said, when I was about 14, 13 perhaps, uh, it was a breath of fresh air to hear about this guy talking about religion in an existential way rather than in a theoretical way. And that's really what drew me to your... And so if you don't mind me asking, David, how old were you when you fell out of, um, you know, the way of the Christian doctrine? Oh, I think about 13 or 14. 13, 14. And what year was that? Oh, what year? Yeah. Oh, well, that would have been uh, about uh, 1968. Yeah. I was going to say, so this is a pretty radical move given the times, hey, because for me it was kind of early 2000s, you know, and Mm – the world was much more progressive, but I'm assuming for someone at 13, 14 to say, you know, this isn't for me implicitly or explicitly was a pretty radical thing. Actually, it wasn't so radical. Um, All right. when, when I look at my family members, like my two sisters fell out of religion before I did, they were older than me and my cousins that I was very much uh, close to, they had already fallen out of religion. So, See, the 60s uh, were called the swinging 60s, and I I wasn't sure that they were swinging. They weren't swinging for me because I was still going to church and doing all the right things. And Actually, I think in my family, my generation, that is the baby boomers, the people born after the Second World War, I was one of the last in my family 
to actually make a break from the church because, um, mm. you know, I, I, I was partly going to church to please my mum and mum and dad. They they were ardent Christians and uh, they'd seen that my sisters had abandoned the path and um, gone in for, you know, they were listening to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and, you know, uh, uh, things so. Uh, like that, that, that pop, pop music. And that was preaching a different gospel to the Christian church. It was preaching the gospel of desire, of free sex, of free love, of doing what feels good. And that was anathema, of course, to the Christian churches at the time. But as, as John Lennon said when he was in bed with Yoko Ono in the Montreal Hotel, which I stayed in a few years ago. And that was oh, wow. Like, uh, yeah, uh, uh, not in his suite because that's in, in the I same bed. <laughs> no, not in the same bed, but right. in the same hotel. He he said to one interviewer that uh, the Beatles are bigger than Jesus. Oh yes, <laughs> yes. And um, and I think that was true. I mean, what the Beatles did was totally revolutionise society. Mm-hmm. And the nineteen sixties were the was the decade which really. Uh, uh, which really destroyed the uh, authority of the churches, and they've never recovered from it. And so, uh, for instance, when I was a, a boy, Tom, um, forty—I think it was forty-eight percent of Australians attended church on a weekly basis. That's incredible. Mm. Think of that now. And mm. uh, today, the figure is uh, about seven, six or seven percent mm. attend churches and and synagogues and temples on a regular basis and that includes all the religions and that's expected Mm. to go down even further like uh, for instance in germany in holland uh in places like um, uh, denmark it's now only one percent of the population uh attending churches and and places of worship on a regular basis you know if churches were businesses, they would have been, uh, the managements would have been sacked years ago and <laughs> someone uh, and a whole new management brought in to say, hey, we better do something that people are interested in rather yeah. than keep on plugging away at what is clearly a self-destructive course. Mm. Uh, but, no, it seems like um, these institutions are going to die with their boots on, so to speak. They're mm. going to keep on keeping on. They're not going to listen to people like Jung who've got, you know, things to say or to Buddhism or Hinduism. A lot of my friends um, uh, at university had abandoned Christianity entirely and gone into Buddhism. That was very fashionable when I was your age. You said you were 27. When I was 27, um, yeah, most of my friends had gone to the East literally They'd gone to the east. They'd taken the big trip over to India and spent time there and uh, meditated and contemplation, yoga, and found a guru to follow. And uh, those friends of mine, who were now probably in their seventies, uh, just just like the remaining Beatles are in their seventies, um, <laughs> that they're still following the east. And uh, so, you know, it's um, a, a time. Why is the East so attractive? Well, because it, it offers direct experience of the spiritual life, direct experience of the Buddha mind, as it says in Buddhism, or as in Hinduism, direct experience of the Atman, which mm. is the God within, um, which uh, connects us, according to Hindu theology and philosophy, with the Brahman, which is their name for God. So um, a lot of people are hungry for all this stuff and um, it's incredible that we've got such a a divided world at the moment. You know, we've got churches saying, where have we gone wrong? But they really don't want to answer that question Mm. because it's going to be too devastating for them. And on the other hand, we've seen an upsurge of interest in spirituality like never before. Uh, I used to teach a course on spirituality at La Trobe University in Melbourne, and it, you know, it started off modestly because students thought, "What on earth is this guy on about?" You know, maybe I was trying to convert them to something or other. <laughs> but no, I wasn't interested in converting them. 
um, radio became interested. There were two TV shows made about that course. Mm. And, uh, you know, that's when I came out with a book I wrote called The Spirituality Revolution. Because in those, so uh, when I started that course, the students were saying, I'm a spiritual person, but I'm not very religious. Yeah. And, you know, it's really hard for people my age and older to even understand what that means because at least until the 1960s, spirituality and religion pretty much was the same thing. Um, A spiritual person was a religious person who wanted to go a step further than the average religious person. In other words, they not only wanted to... um, turn up to churches uh, on Sundays, but they wanted to experience uh, God or the Holy Spirit or whatever they called it uh, on a daily basis. And those people were called very spiritual, but really they were very religious. And so now you know, we've moved to a world where spiritual people say they're not very religious. And uh, 50, 60 years ago, spiritual people were very, very religious. So, you know, um, this um, shift in society is dramatic and that's why I've been, one of the reasons I've been churning out so many books Mm. is because I I didn't feel there were too many people in Australia interested in this phenomenon. Um, People would just dismiss it and say, oh, it's a passing fad. But, you know, a passing fad of the 60s. You've got to be kidding. Here we are. In the into the uh, third decade of the 21st century, and if anything, spiritual but not religious is getting more and more uh, popular, and more and more uh, people are turning in that direction. So it's hardly a passing fad of the 1960s. It's a it's an incredibly uh, moving um, shift in society, and the churches. As I say, uh, I feel sorry for them, actually, because, like, they just don't get it, you know. They're like embarrassing grandparents uh, that you have who, who you know, they look at the, the dances and the music and the hairstyles and fashions of today and they scratch their heads and they say, I, I don't know what, you know, the youth of today are so lost. Mm. You know, I don't know where they're going. How are they going to find their way back onto the tried and true path and that sort of stuff. And, you know, they are embarrassing. I mean, their lack of touch is embarrassing for everybody Um, and especially for them, I think. So that's the situation we have at the moment. And, um, yeah, I've turned out 16 books Mm -hmm. on this topic. Most of them have been published in London or New York, uh, because I couldn't even get Australian publishers interested. See, that book you were talking about before, that was published in London and New York. I couldn't get it published here. So Australia, we're we're so out of touch. It's a sleepy hollow here. We are so far behind the time. People in in Britain and and Western Europe and uh, Eastern Europe, North America, and South America too, are way ahead of us in this debate. And uh, there's so much stuff being written that um, I can't even keep up with it myself. And I'm sort of full-time devoted to the area. But um, I, I, you know, Australia, yeah, you know, our religion is sport. It's, it's, mm. I mean, I, uh, like you, Tom, I began life trying to be an AFL star, I think. Oh, yes. <laughs> Uh, I was uh, a mad Carlton supporter and I played football, amateur football, and um, I'm not a tall guy because my heritage is Irish. Actually, yours is too, isn't it? It is too, mate. Mum's also Irish. (laughs) I thought so. With a name like Thomas O'Hearn, that sounds very (laughs) Irish to me. And um, so I'm only about five foot seven, you know, so I could play on the wing or as a rover. And um, I loved it because it was how I expressed my masculinity because my mind was totally into these philosophical and psychological areas. um, But I love footy and I still do, but it's not my religion. It's not, it's not enough to be anybody's uh, guiding religion or or guiding philosophy in life. Although it's Mm. a lot of fun and I love it. But um, so most people in Australia 
you know, say, well, if it's not footy, shopping is my religion. You know, what do they call it? Retail therapy. Um, <laughs> retail therapy. And there's a lot of people that flood into the shopping malls thinking that's where they're going to find meaning. And, of course, they don't. Mm. And, and then a lot of people drop out of football and drop out of, of shopping and they fall into drugs. And that's a really bad path because uh, it's, it's a destructive vortex. It's a downward spiral. I had friends of mine in the 1960s and 70s that got into drugs and, um, and some of them died uh, and some of them blew their brains out with drugs and are now just zombies. So I'm not too keen on that. A lot of my students at the university were into what's called ayahuasca. Have you ever heard of that? I have ayahuasca. Absolutely. I, yes. It's a very, very I, potent psychedelic from South America. Which they get from South America. Yes. And, you know, you can't fly at the moment to South America. You can't fly anywhere at the moment, but a lot of them would come back with these sort of magical mystery tour uh, stories. And, and I was a, a, a wet blanket to them because I said, <laughs> I don't think drugs is the way forward. I think we've got to shift our consciousness, our minds, our understanding of things. And maybe yeah. drugs can kickstart that, but maybe they can't, you know. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, what? what, what uh, sorry, Philosophy. David, go for it. Go, go ahead. Well, Alan Watts was the big philosopher, uh, popular philosopher of the 1960s. And he said, drugs can uh, uh, give you a message and then, but then you've got to hang up. He's using a telephone metaphor. Then you've got to hang up the phone. Otherwise you get hung up is what he used to say. Mm. And Aldous Huxley said uh, mm. that drugs can open the doors of perception. But um, if you have too many drugs and get hooked on them, they blow the doors of perception off their hooks and, and then you're left in some nearly psychotic state struggling from, from day to day or even minute to minute. And uh, <clears throat> it's important to close that door uh, between the conscious and the unconscious and so that you can live in the normal world and live a normal life raise a family if that's what you want to do or do something that's responsible in society. And, uh, and then uh, when you've got quiet time, you can open that door again mm. and uh, go into that uh, deep inner place, whether through meditation, contemplation, prayer, dancing, walking in nature, all these sorts of ways that we've got to, uh, to deepen our lives. Mm. It's very, very important. Mm. Yeah, and you know, couple of couple of points on that. I I, I think, um, yeah, it's it's so important. You know, one of the things that Jung said was, "Be careful for wisdom you didn't ask for." And I think, you know, with the rise of psychedelics, you know, like to your point, what Aldous Huxley was talking about with the big mind that can give you access mm. to this incredible knowledge. You know, the tr the true confrontation with God, if that word resonates with you, but. Um, doing so can blast you so far open. And if you haven't, um, you know, cultivated awareness, integrated, broken down those layers in a mm. safe way, it can, it can yeah. be overwhelming, I think. And um, that's one of the things, you know, psychedelics are really, really kind of coming up again. Um, mm. But I think people see psychedelics as the, 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 the thing they need that will, that will fix their lives. And I think to your point, you know, it's, mm. it's a tool like, um, like meditation or going for a walk is. Mm. Yeah. It's a dangerous tool. Um, I, I, I found that, as I said, some of my students got into drugs, but, and, and, uh, they would just literally blow their minds with them and then they would mm. call me up the university and say, uh, David, I've, uh, I'm, I'm in a psychiatric ward. I wow. took some drugs and I couldn't handle it and I'm now out of control. And can you come here and uh, help wow. me out? And I did a couple of times. But, um, see, yeah, yeah, I'm very ambivalent about it because I've seen too much. I'm, I'm too old to get interested <laughs> in drugs. It's, it's just not the way forward. And... Um, but uh, perhaps a bit of 
marijuana or a bit of cannabis is okay. But then when you move into cocaine and uh, LSD and uh, ice and all those sorts of things, you're moving into very dangerous territory. But what I think the drug um, culture does show us is the desperation that people have that normality isn't good enough. Yeah. You know, that be told to, to, to work in the day and come home and watch the news at night and eat dinner and go to bed and do it all again, that we need more than that. You know, we mm. are creatures mm. that need meaning. Mm. And the current setup of Australian society, um, you know, little wonder young people have lost all interest in politics. And I'm sure if voting were not compulsory here in Australia, a lot of young people wouldn't vote at all because, uh, you know, it's just so the whole thing, liberal versus labor, you know, it's so boring. Yeah. Uh, and they basically both got the same ideas anyway. And they're both trying to sort of, uh, uh, prove each other wrong, but, uh, labor, uh, doesn't present an, a viable alternative. The Liberals, you know, are, 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 will be in power, I think, for a long time to come with their mm-hmm. coalition with the National Party. The poor old Greens, you know, hover on the edge of the spectrum. And then you've got the lunatic fringe, you know, like Pauline Hanson and people <laughs> like that uh, who uh, are never going to get anywhere, thank mm-hmm. God. <laughs> I'm just so pleased I live in Australia and not America. Oh yeah. You know, I don't think I don't think Australians would ever be stupid enough to elect a buffoon like Donald Trump uh, as president, you know, or as prime minister. I we, you know, you've got to hand it to Australia, and and that in some ways, although we're kind of flat and a bit boring, at least we're not mad like the United States is, is at times mad, like all these killings of black people uh, by, the, by the police and uh, the incarceration of black people by the authorities in North America, all these shootings and massacres in schools and campuses and, and shopping centres, you know, thank God, you know, well, we've had a, the Hoddle Street massacre and we've also yeah. had the Port Arthur massacre. But after that, John Howard, and full credit to him, decided that uh, people weren't going to have access to firearms in the way that yep. they did in the past. Um, and But in America, you try and say that. Uh, the, mm. uh, the Rifle Association, the, the gun lobby, talk about the Constitution and the, the ability to bear firearms being mm. a constitutional right. So Australia, we've got great common sense, and I'm I'm really deeply appreciative of our common sense. What we need now is some uncommon sense. You know, we need to keep the common sense there, and have uncommon sense. By which I mean, we need some spiritual discussions. We need mm. deepening of our longing for meaning. We need mm. more um, introduction to philosophy to psychology, to all these sorts of, and you mentioned comparative religions. Um, And um, when I was at La Trobe University, one of the uh, departments to be sacked while I was there was the religious studies department because the vice chancellor Chancellor at the time said that this is a secular university and uh, we're not going to have, you know, religious studies here and booted it out. And then, of course, along came 9-11, which was preeminently a religious catastrophe yeah. of, you know, uh, militant Islamic people uh, attacking America with its uh, uh, so-called secular society and its capitalism yeah. and the World Trade Towers, the symbol of American capitalism, being targeted by militant religious people. And then, um, you know, I said to people in my university, it's clear that religion's not going to go away. It's now being manifested pathologically Mm. in in terms of uh, of, uh, 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 violence and things like that, but it's not going to go away. And uh, I think ultimately the the drug epidemic in Australia is at at bottom a spiritual problem. It's people who look around and say, 
there's got to be more than this. And someone says to them, yeah, there's more than this. Let me, let me, let me give you a dose of what I've got in my bag and that'll show you there is more. Um, <laughs> so um, I think the drug epidemic is an epidemic of meaninglessness, actually, and that to stem the drug epidemic, um, <laughs> excuse me, we can't just say people have to behave themselves. Yes. Because the impulse to drugs is quite a genuine one, but it doesn't have an outlet. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I agree with literally everything you said there, and I want to. I want to bring this point that you made before about politics because I think you're right. I think um, young kids, younger demographics, don't really have an interest in politics because no. there's it's just so much um, disingenuousness around it. There's no authenticity. If you're no. establishment, you ha- you you sound like a robot um, because you just have that's where all the money is. If you're independent, mm. obviously I'm speaking about America here, but if you're independent, you don't have any money, so you can't run anyway because the campaigns cost so much. Yeah. One thing you said before you were talking about um, putting a celebrity into power, and to, to your point, you just have to wonder out of 350 million plus people or whatever it is, um, celebrities seem to be taking the yeah. position there. But you're yeah. obviously um, very well versed in um, religious scholarship and you know, in the Old Testament, prior to Moses coming down and proclaiming the, the, the 10 commandments, all of the Israelites were worshiping false idols. So I wonder if you could speak on that as to how that plays out in modern society. Well, I think, um, I think it's a big mistake in a way to put celebrities in power, you know, uh, for instance, one of the, one of the most boring parts of the football culture is at the end of the game, they get the microphones out and interview the people that killed, <laughs> kicked the most goals. Yeah. And they say, oh, you know, yeah, I had a, a good game, but look, full credit to the boys. Not, it wasn't exactly. me. You know, that was just. It's the same person. <laughs> yeah, blah, blah, blah. And then I just want to turn it off, you know, yeah. so that, like, in other words, people who are good at sport are very good at sport but don't expect them to be good at speaking and don't expect them to be good at uh, analysis of the football game Mm -hmm. and certainly don't expect them to be good at running the country. Um, And this is where America has made the big mistake. People, all these celebrities, you know, who have been presidents or mayors like uh, Donald Trump and uh, uh, Reagan, Ronald Reagan and Clint Eastwood and Arnold Schwarzenegger, Look, the list goes on and on and on. Um, They think that the most uh, celebrated members of society will make good leaders, but they don't. Why? Because they basically got to the top through being incredibly selfish and egotistic and very concerned about their own wealth and their own pride and their own fame. And, And if that doesn't make good leaders, a good leader has to be someone with compassion, somebody who cares about other people, who cares about the nation. Um, And we see this um, going on in the United States at the moment, uh, the president just denying the the pandemic and saying, Mm. we want to open America up for business. You know, while people are dying in their tens of thousands, it's so uncompassionate, It's, it's almost psychotic. And this is what happens when you elect uh, uh, celebrities to lead the country. Um, And, um, you know, they're well known, but that's all they are. And they don't have any platform. They don't have any policies. And um, I think, um, for instance, let's think about, say, a country that I've spent a lot of time in, which is Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Could anybody Mm -hmm. name the president of Switzerland? The answer to that is no. Nobody would know who the president of Switzerland is. Why? Because he or she is doing a good job. Mm, Um, They are running their country. They're not creating controversy. They're not on the news every night the way the the Trump figure is. And um, they are just doing their job very well. And therefore, they don't become uh, newsworthy 
until mm. really they make a big mistake and then suddenly they're on the news. So I think politics ought to be concerned with running the country and uh, uh, attending to the social issues and the economic issues and not to the personality issues of the, of the, of the people themselves. And any country that is more concerned with the personality of their leaders is on the wrong track. And politics has to get, get back on track. And, uh, but the Australia, we're following the American example in part. And, uh, and I think that's the wrong way. I think the American example is very bad and should not be uh, copied in any way. Yeah, yeah, and and this is where I think the the um, this is where I think it gets a bit tricky because to some degree, this is why I think it's so unfortunate that a um, you know a so something like religious studies, which sounds very secular to me, so that's the contradiction there. Studying different religions, you know, without being like, oh, we're just Christian, we're just um, Hindu, but we're, we're actually comparing and distinguishing. Um, is really important so that we mm. can actually understand what it means to be spiritual, to take on um, personal yeah. beliefs, you know, the God within Gnosis, as you said before, and then mm. push that into the political world. And I think as soon as people start to hear spirituality and politics, they get very scared because it's like, well, we've just done so much work in removing ourselves from all that dogma. But I think yeah. where you and I agree on it, it's, it's very much around the the secular values that um, are really, really important. You know, we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. We want to keep a lot of that good stuff mm. so that we can learn how to cultivate meaning for ourselves as, as one example. When, when the, uh, when the uh, former colonies or what we now call the States of Australia federated in 1901, it was decided by all the founding fathers, I don't think there were too many mothers there, Mm. Uh, that Australia would be a secular nation, namely, unlike Britain, which, of course, uh, a lot of people go back to Britain or Ireland or Scotland, Wales, uh, we would not have a religion as the uh, actual official religion of the nation. And that was seen at the time as a good thing, even by religious people thought that uh, our being a secular nation was a positive step away from the kind of divisiveness of uh, the Catholics versus the Protestants, for instance, was the big rift in the Australian uh, uh, population around about the time of 1900 uh, because of so many people coming from Ireland, most of whom were Catholic, uh, but some of them were Protestant, and British, most of whom were Protestant, uh, although some of them were Catholic too. So the reason that the secular nature of Australia was arrived at was to provide some kind of level playing field where economics and politics would not be uh, directed by religious institutions and religious persuasions. Now, over the course of time, uh, as I see it, secular turned into secularism. Hmm. So, in other words, secular became an ideology of its own hmm. rather than just a some something which said, right, we've got to separate the church from the state and not allow the church to influence the political life of the state. Of course, that did happen, even though it was uh, not officially uh, condoned. But then a kind of an atheistic mentality took over, which was personified actually in Julia Gillard, uh, the first Australian woman prime minister, I, I was a supporter of hers at first and then gradually I could see that because she was um, uh, an atheist, um, this, you know, is a very uh, bad ideology in my view. Um, basically it sort of says all oh, we are are material beings. We have to make haste while we can. We have to build our little nest of financial security and our family network and then we sort of pop off into the ether and that's the end of story. I, that's not enough. That's not a good story. And, um, <clears throat> and I think that um, what we need is somebody which, as you're suggesting, we, we need more universal spirituality rather than 
parochial or tribal spirituality. Exactly. Know? Yeah. The, the Catholics have their have their Jesuit spirituality and their Benedictine and their Carmelite and all those sorts of orders within the Catholic Church have their spirituality, but they're very tribal. And one of the interesting things of the last, say, nearly 100 years is that most of the creative minds in religion have all been concerned with discovering a universal spirituality which is greater than the tribal religions. So, for instance, take uh, Thomas Merton in America or B. Griffiths in Britain or William Johnston, who was from Britain and spent his time, uh, I met him actually, uh, Mm -hmm. which was good, in Tokyo looking at Zen Buddhism. And all these people, male and female ones, um, were trying to find a universal spirituality. And they found... they. They had some kind of sense of the desperation of this because if we couldn't find a universal spirituality, then we can't find anything that's going to bind us instead of divide us. And so I think the secular nature of Australia was one step on the way, but then it kind of got siphoned off into atheism, which is secularism. So secular became an ideology. And that's not uh, the way forward. I think we've got to stay officially secular. We can't afford to have a religion running the country. That ends up a theocracy. And those theocracies overseas, uh, places like Libya and Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran, they're all theocracies run by the churches or the synagogues or the the mosques. They they end up being more corrupt and more dangerous than the Mm. secular governments. So we've got to deepen our secularism, uh, our secular society. We've got to find access to the universal qualities of spirituality, which means comparative religion and and looking at Buddhism and and studying Hinduism and studying Aboriginal Australian religions as well and studying North American uh, native religions and in order to find common threads so that they, they can bind us together in a way, uh, you know, which, which gives meaning to the whole of life. So we've had a globalization process at the sphere of economics and increasingly politics, but we haven't had a globalization process in the sphere of spirituality. You know, we've still got the tribes operating, you know, I'm a Baptist or I'm a, a Muslim or, you know, I'm a, a Sikh or something like that. Now, I don't want to diminish those. Traditions are important, but we need to develop something that's beyond them, which is, uh, I think, for the sake of the planet as a whole. We Mm. need a spiritual ecology, if you like, just Mm. as we need a natural ecology to save the planet from uh, ecological devastation. We need a spiritual ecology to save humankind from tearing each other apart each one believing that its belief system is absolute and right. We can't yeah. have that. It's dangerous. Anyone who says they've got the truth and the only truth and nothing but the truth, you know, they should be told off, you know, yeah. not, 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 not become leaders. They should be uh, relegated to the, uh, the loony bin because there is no such thing as absolute truth but there is clearly truths in the plural which have things in common, and that's the path that I I feel I'm on myself. I'm interested in truths in the plural rather than truth with a capital T. I think that's why I've resonated so much with your work, David, is because I think that's the fallacy of the um, scientists, you know, and the atheists to a certain extent as well, that idea that there, there is irrespective of the fact that we, we might not be able to perceive objective reality. It is there and we are going to devote all our attention to, to that material world. But to, to your point, there is, there are subjective truths, which are nonetheless, um, mm. you know, relevant. They're, they're just as important. I think when you're talking about meaning and, and, and social mm. responsibility um, as, as, objective reality and that truth, which has helped us obviously speak over Zoom. <laughs> Yeah, there are subjective realities, but what Jung found 
was that those subjective realities at their deepest level are actually objective at the same time. Mm. And this is what, you know, this is what he, he, one of the messages he gained from India, that what we experience is subjective, our feelings, our emotions, you know, our gut instinct, our sense of what's right and wrong, that those, um, that shouldn't just stay with the human subject or the single person. Those things go further and have roots in the objective. So he, he called, he ended up dropping the term collective unconscious and talking about the objective psyche, you know, and I like that mm. term, objective psyche, you know, so there's an objective psyche which is experienced subjectively, but in itself it's more than subjective. It's actually, yes. and the only way you can experience the objective psyche, ironically, or paradoxically, is through the subjective. <laughs> but, um, you know, and so that he breaks down those dualisms between subject <laughs> and object, and that's what I think is very important about his work, and um, that's the dimension missing in uh, the world religions uh, as they're currently uh, constructed. So is that okay? Okay, so because um, uh, when you're when you're talking about there is an objective, um, you know, uh, measurable, empirical, you know. Um, mm way that the psyche operates, although it is yeah. experienced as a subject, that is how the psyche operates on the whole. Is, mm. is that kind of, um, cause you were talking before about we need kind of like a global spirituality. I always mm. felt that Joseph Campbell was trying to do that sort of thing with his work around the, the myth that all the myths were trying to talk about. Yeah. Is there a correlation there? Oh, absolutely. I, I was lucky enough to meet Joseph Campbell. Oh, uh, wow in the United States. And he was very keen on talking to me about Australian Aboriginal cultures um, because I grew up in Alice Springs, you see, which is at the centre of uh, Aboriginal Australia and the Aboriginal yeah. cultures. I could talk to you some other time perhaps about that. Yeah, but, I'd love to. Uh, Mate, we've got to grab a coffee together when, the, uh, when all this is... Well, uh... <laughs> we have to stand rather than sit. Uh, That's right. But, uh, I think the way into this universal spirituality uh, is comparative religious studies. Yeah. And it, or as J Joseph Campbell called it, comparative mythological studies. See, for Joseph Campbell and for Jung, most of the religions are, are, are metaf metaphorical uh, and mythological systems. Um, Christianity uh, was unusual in claiming for itself uh, historical truth mm. um, uh, as the basis of their scriptures, things like the virgin birth, the physical resurrection. You know, these were presented to people in the past anyway as historical facts or realities. Uh, but for Hillman and, and uh, for, for for Joseph Campbell and James Hillman and Jung, the three teachers that I've had, these aren't so much historical facts as they are important metaphors or myths, if you like. But the problem there, as soon as you tell people that, that their religion is mythological, they, say, they think that you're trying to undermine them and because they don't have the imagination to know that myth is very important. It's not just a lot of rubbish. It's not just as fat fantasy or fairy tales mm. myths are what bind us together we have important myths and those myths need to be honored but um so that's one of the one of the ways of moving toward a universal uh, spirituality is to accept that all religions uh have historical elements in them of course you know the buddha was a real person jesus Christ was a real person, Muhammad was a real person, but the stories that develop around them, like, you know, the virgin birth, for instance, is so clearly mythological and absolutely untrue. Uh, but it's still a useful uh, idea. <clears throat> it's a useful symbol. And um, so that's the first step. Um, and Christianity and Islam and Judaism they all have problems with taking their scriptures literally. And if you take it literally, like if, you know, the Jews think that God literally made them the special children of God, well, you know, 
what arrogance is that? You know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's little wonder that the poor Jews have been maligned and harassed mm. and, 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 and bullied and, uh, well, in the Second World War, massacred. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> because any group that says we, are, we have a hotline to God, pity the rest of you bastards, you, know, you don't have the hotline that we have, well, that's just going to create conflict yeah. and hatred and enmity. And envy violence. as well. Hey? En en and envy, a mass amount. That's right. And Christianity <laughs> fell into that same trap by saying that Jesus was the only human being who's actually an incarnation of God. Well, what a load of rubbish is that? Mm. You know, and no wonder the, the Islamic people hate the Christians and uh, no wonder the Jews hate the Christians too because in Jewish Judaism they have the idea of a Messiah but they don't believe that um, Jesus was that Messiah and they've got every right to believe that in my view. Um, it's only Christians who see Jesus as the Messiah. So we've got a lot of work to do to um, create a level playing field to, on the one hand, respect individual traditions and, uh, and their beliefs, but on the other hand say that we've got to connect to something greater because the survival of the planet, the survival of the species, the survival of all species is now dependent on our ability to find some common thread of meaning that, that, that uh, cuts across all old traditions and old beliefs and challenges them, of course, to some extent. Mm. So um, that's, the, that's the religious challenge of the future. And I, I have always found Jung and Joseph Campbell, as you said, uh, to be key figures in shining that light toward that universal spirituality. Why don't you think um, not so much Mahayana Buddhism but Theravada Buddhism with that idea that, you know, Buddha was the awakened one, not so much the Buddha within. Um, why don't you think that um, school of Buddhism has copped as much um, hate and violence as the Abrahamic faiths? Um, well, in the course of history, at least until recently, Buddhism has been a fairly peaceful religion. You know, it's, um, uh, it's only in the last uh, 40, even 30 years that some Buddhists have become uh, militant um, mm. and, uh, and proactive about their causes, especially when they see their religion being uh, contradicted yeah. or uh, disrespected. But, you see, Christianity pretty much from... Uh, from the early years, was always militant. You know, there was that song called Onward Christian Soldiers Marching as to War with the Cross of Jesus Going on Before, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And the Crusades, which were uh, launched by all the Catholic countries, because, of course, at the time there wasn't such thing as Protestantism, all the Catholic countries, Britain, Spain, France, Italy, uh, and uh, all united to attack the uh, holy lands, as they were called, because the, uh, uh, the Islamic people had taken over uh, the holy city of Jerusalem. And uh, the Christian crusades were doing untold damage in mm -hmm. trying to um, reclaim Jerusalem for Christianity. Um, <clears throat> and... Um, that kind of thing is the complete opposite of what Jesus taught. Yeah. It's like these people had never read the Bible. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. the, I think the most important thing about Jesus is the Sermon on the Mount yeah. where he talks about loving your enemy as yourself, loving your neighbour. Uh, it's all about love. I mean, Jesus was a lot like John Lennon. Yeah. Um, John <laughs> Lennon was make love, not war, well, Jesus was saying the exact same thing. Although John Lennon was, of course, meaning make sex and not war. <laughs> so he, more, he sort of broadened the category of love. But, <laughs> you know, there's a very great similarity between what the Beatles were saying and what Jesus was saying, actually. And um, 
And then a lot of Christians are, are really in your face, arrogant uh, fundamentalists, don't tolerate people of other beliefs. This is all the opposite of Jesus. Jesus was a peacemaker. Mm-hmm. He accepted the Samaritans. He accepted the Gentiles. And so um, my grandfather used to say, David, there's a great difference between churchianity and Christianity. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. He's right. Yeah, he's right. And he told me that when I was about five. I had no idea what he was talking about. I couldn't understand it at that age. But as I grew up, I began to realise that the churches are not are not uh, in the spirit of Jesus at all. They're doing something else entirely. And that's why maybe they should all go down and, and be destroyed because uh, the whole thing has to be rebuilt. Mm. But um, Buddhists um, have been pacifists mostly. And so they could say, that, as you say, the Theravadan tradition, which uh, believes that uh, uh, Buddha was the incarnation of the Buddha mind. Mm. And uh, I'm happy with that. I mean, that doesn't upset me. Um, And they didn't impose it on other people. They didn't walk around. Yeah, that's the difference. Mm. You know, they didn't walk around and tyrannise and say, unless you become a Theravadan Buddhist, uh, we'll kill you. We'll slit your throat. Whereas, you know, um, it's so ironic, you know, the Roman Empire... In the, in the very early days, was responsible, of course, for Jesus being crucified. And then 250 years later, Rome made Christianity its official religion. I know. Uh, <laughs> so, you know. So that's how fickle the whole thing is. And then if you weren't a Christian, then you could be uh, murdered or put at the stake for not being a Christian, mm. whereas 250 years earlier, 300 years earlier, you were murdered or put on the cross for being a Christian. So it's like you know, there's, there's so much bullshit and all this stuff, you know, so much nonsense uh, associated with religion. It's little wonder that many, many young people today say, I don't want any part of it. It's just all about violence and ideology and imposing uh, views on other people. I don't yeah. want to be part of it. And I can understand that. I suppose the the um, negative impact with that, and I'm you know using myself as an anecdote here, is that I, I was very much in that um, in that view. You know, I um, uh, dispensed with my Christian Catholic upbringing um, because it was just mm. all bullshit, and I thought it was just all you know. There's no such thing as like a supernatural god, you know, white man with a beard sort of thing. Um, no. But then. In doing so, I lost the carpet of meaning was pulled from beneath my feet. And then I was like, okay, now I'm really separate and I'm just trying to find a, you know, make my way in this scientific world of things, you know, but how am I supposed to act? Like, what am I, how can I transcend myself? How can I, you know, yeah. all, all these wonderful things. And I feel like, you know, the movement of atheism, which, you know, we should probably just um, mention is just, you know, a non-belief in a theistic God. So a, a one God, which is really interesting because mm. to a certain extent, I'm an atheist definitively, you know? Um, um, but what it stands for is something that I'm not with. So um, I thought I always found that quite interesting, but um, how do we then, you know, get people to, to start to think, um, well, hang on, there's a lot of harm in throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Well, I, as you define it, I'm an atheist as well. Yeah. Uh, oh, absolutely. The idea that there's this one supernatural God up in the sky or in the heavens or something uh, with Jesus sitting on his right hand, <laughs> it's, all, it's all nonsense. You know, it's all just complete and utter nonsense. Mm. Um, and... Um, and I think that's why I've always seen atheism as the beginning of your spiritual journey, mm. you know, because once you realise that all that stuff is, is garbage, then you've started your own spiritual journey. And mm. so students would come up to me at the university and say, you know, you're talking about God 
and uh, every now and then. Although I talked about God less and less because I could see that people had this idea of God as a supernatural figure in the sky yeah. and that that was the, the figure that Richard Dawkins uh, tried to destroy in his book, The God Delusion. Yeah. Know, and uh, Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris and all those people. I agree with all of them because the God they're destroying is a God I don't believe in anyway. Um, they're destroying the phony God, um, the God created by human culture that said that, uh, firstly, that, the God, that said that God is he. What a lot of nonsense is that? <laughs> why not she? Or why not nothing? You know, why not it? I can remember going to the uh, tennis centre in Melbourne, uh, the Rod Laver Arena, and hearing... Um, the uh, talk given by the Dalai Lama, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama of Tibet. And he had question time. And at the end, uh, a, a young person put up their hand and said, uh, 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 Your Holiness, uh, do you believe in God? And he broke into laughter, peals and peals of raucous laughter that went on rather embarrassingly long, I thought, <laughs> for all those poor, poor believers uh, sitting oh, no. in the audience. And he, he, just, um, he just could not come at this idea of God, mainly because um, the way people use it, the way they define God is so absurd that most intelligent people could never, ever uh, believe in that kind of image of God. Um, <clears throat> mm. So, uh, you know, and the Dalai Lama, of course, I respect him a great deal. And uh, <clears throat> so... Um, when we say that those religions are non-theistic, in fact, a lot of religious studies people say that Buddhism is not a religion at all. It's a philosophy of life. You know, I, I don't mind that as long as it's, it's not said pejoratively. Mm. Uh, I think uh, Buddhism is a religion, but it's a really good religion, which didn't mm -hmm. come up with any of these ridiculous ideas about an old man sitting in the sky taking notes about our moral behaviour and stuff mm. like this. That is clearly a total fantasy and uh, we have to get rid of that. And that's where I agree with Richard Dawkins in his book, The God Delusion, and all that stuff by uh, Sam Harris and others. Um, but we've got to go on from that. Once we demolish the phony God, yeah. we've then got to try and find the true God. That's the, that's, the, that's the task that I think we've got. And it might take two or three, four hundred years to get there, but I'm certainly involved in that. But when I talk about God, I don't talk about God in the old man in the sky stuff. It, that's just bullshit. Um, and uh, so when I learnt from my students that they had a, a mental conception of God, which was that old man in the sky, that's when I stopped talking about God at all. So a lot of, lot of our problems today is about language. You know, what, do, what on earth do we call this thing which is deeper than all of us, which is in, eternal and enduring? Um, and um, I'm happy for Buddhists to call it the Buddha mind. Um, I'm happy for Hindus to call it the Brahman. Uh, you know, and I'm happy for Islamic people to call it Allah. Uh, I'm happy for anyone because all our constructions of, of this eternal reality are going to be, uh, as we used to say, man-made, mm. or we have to say now human-made. Um, mm. There can be no uh, descriptions of ultimate reality uh, and any description, as the philosopher Derrida said, any description of God is not a description, it's an interpretation which is yeah. quite different from a description. And that's the problem is that a lot of believers feel that their ideas of God are descriptions of what God is actually like. And all I can say is that's just nonsense. It's worse than nonsense. It's blasphemy. You, yes. can't, develop, you can't develop fixed images of something which is eternal, immortal, and infinite. We are finite creatures and we cannot our finite minds <clears throat> can never define the infinite. Mm. You can't do that in space, in outer space. You can't do it in inner space either, and you can't do it in the religious fields either. 
So um, there's a lot of learning that has to be done. But when people come up to me and say they're an atheist, I say, congratulations, you've, you've moved your first step along the way. Uh, mm. Just don't stay there. It's not, the, yeah. not, it's, the, it's not the destination. It's the first station on the way to somewhere else. Um, That's brilliant. <laughs> That's brilliant. I, I like the, um, the, the Taoist interpretation, you know, the Tao is the way and, mm. you know, in the Tao Te Ching, it's um, the, the Tao that is said is not the true Tao because I think yeah. what, what, what Jung really showed me was his, just his total um, analysis of the universe of polarity I started looking into the karma cycles and pain and pleasure and how my life was in many ways predicated towards running over here just so I could get away from there, but then Mm. inevitably finding myself back there. So trying to step off the wheel and then have Mm. to think about what I was actually doing. (laughs) I think the East is ahead of the West spiritually. And I think we envy the East, you know, like, Taoism is especially, as you said, one of the greatest wisdom system, systems of the world. And when you open up the Tao Te Ching, one of the first things it says, as you said, is the, the Tao that can be named or spoken is not the true true Tao. And I just think full marks to that. That's absolutely getting it off on the right, in the right step. Yeah, yeah. But if only we had that in Christianity you know, that the God that can be named is not the true God. <clears throat> People would go around hunting you as a, a blasphemer or a heretic That's or something. It's crazy, but, isn't it? Mm. I know. So the, the East have that deeper wisdom. Uh, the West uh, are more concerned with locking things in certainty. We need to know. But the East are more advanced mm. because they don't need to know. All they want to do is, is be receptive to the mysteries mm. of life and to accept the fact that what is infinite is infinitely beyond us, but we still need to strive toward it. We yes. can't just say because it's infinite and I'm finite, that, that therefore uh, I, I can make no approach to the great mystery. We, we can and must make an approach to the great mystery, but <clears throat> knowing that um, any attempt to do so is relative. And this is where uh, Einstein's theory of relativity comes in. You know, we need relativity at the level of religion that, you know, everyone's claim to know God is got to be seen as relative, not absolute, but relative. And then we have a common basis for all faiths to get together to create a universal spirituality. But when Mm. I first discovered the Taoism, like you, I think I was bowled over by it. Mm. I've read I've read the Tao Te Ching so many times um, and it's so full of wisdom and the I Ching too uh, is a great book of wisdom and all those uh, ancient Chinese texts. And then you look at China today, you know, which is this bully uh, superpower trying to uh, commandeer uh, uh, places in the South China Sea and create the Belt and Road and all these sorts of things. And you think, what's happened to that country's uh, cosmology? You know, how many people in China, how many Chinese people still have that deep spiritual wisdom that you find in the Tao Te Ching? I don't know, but I'd like to know. And Mm. surely, surely the, the leaders, the political leaders of China are not reflective, hopefully, the majority of Chinese people would have some of that wisdom and not just be bullies on the world scene. But I don't know these answers to these questions. Yeah. It's a funny one. You mentioned before that that idea of um, striving towards the infinite and, um, Mm. you know, that, that old Jewish idea that what is the, what, what is something, uh, that is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent, what does that lack? And it lacks limitation. It's the only thing that it lacks. It lacks humility too. It lacks humility too. It absolutely lacks humility too. But that idea of striving for self-transcendence, you know, that idea of 
okay, these are where my limits are mm-hmm. because I'm not perfect. I'm not God. I'm not, in, mm-hmm. in the way that you and I say, I'm not simultaneously mm-hmm. omnipotent, omniscient and omnipresent. The work cut out for me, therefore, is to expand my horizons, expand my consciousness and transcend my limitations. And I think um, mm. that idea of God is so absolutely, unbelievably important um, to, to humanity, you know, from an individual and a social perspective as well. Absolutely. But I think a lot of people, uh, I was recently addressing uh, an, a large audience full of Jewish people at the, the Jewish Museum, and um, mm. a lot of those people there, uh, older ones especially, are people who either went through or remembered anyway uh, the Holocaust. Mm. <laughs> and a lot of them lost their conventional faith because if God was those three things you said, you know, omniscient, uh, omnipresent and uh, what was the other one? Omnipotent. Om- omnipotent. Well, then how could God have stood yeah. by and watched six, six million Jews be massacred by this maniac Hitler um, if God was capable of all those things mm. uh, and did nothing? There were no miracles in the concentration camps, there was just the stark reality and the horror of, uh, of a maniacal German society deciding to, to, uh, destroy, uh, and, and to, to wreak genocide on this extraordinary people. Um, and so I think that a lot of, uh, Jewish people have actually lost their traditional faith because they've said, well, if that God exists, uh, then he's either asleep or um, in, in, incapable of, of, of interacting. But a lot of the more thoughtful ones have said to themselves, well, there never was an omniscient, omnipotent and um, all-powerful God. This was a fantasy of our own creation. That's not to say that God can't intervene. I think God can intervene, but <clears throat> God intervenes when God wants to, not when someone asks God to. And that's why I think petitionary prayer is very limited. You know, you go to churches and they say, can you, you know, my aunt has got a very bad case of bronchitis. God, can you please heal her? <laughs> yes. Like that. You know, oh, I, I just thought, oh, you know. That's not- <laughs> God's like, I'm probably going to have to cancel my two o'clock, but I'll get to you shortly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, we just need more help in understanding what this God looks like and and what, well, we don't know what this God looks like, but what this God is, I'm sure there's God, um, in one of the the chapters of my recent book called the post secular sacred, I have a chapter called God after God. And I think that's where I'm at. I'm interested Mm. in the God that arises after the death of God. And in, 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 um, continental, excuse me, in continental philosophy at the moment, they're talking about the death of the death of God. Wow. (laughs) Nietzsche times two. (laughs) Nietzsche times two. And I was, you know, I was, I was driving through Melbourne when you could drive um, and I noticed on a, a bumper sticker it, it said um, at the top, the bumper sticker, it said, God is dead, dash Nietzsche. And then underneath it said, Nietzsche is dead, God. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. That is so awesome. And, and I think that there's a bit of a truth in that. Um, I don't doubt <clears throat> that there is a God, but I do doubt our capacity to understand this. Yes. God. Yes. And anyone that claims uh, special knowledge is just really up themselves in my mm. mm. So we've got, David, we've got to begin that uh, humility process. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to um, grab a copy of that book. That's good. I'm, I'm building up my library of, uh, of Tacy works here. So oh, that's um, cool. Um, <laughs> But again, you see, like all my books, it wasn't published in Australia. Yes. Um, 
Yes. And when I when people write to me, uh, they assume I'm in London or New York because all my books are published in London, New York. I say no. I I live at the bottom end of the world in a town called Melbourne, and they say yeah. what. What are, you, what are you there for? Yeah, um, that's, that's probably a valid question. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it seems odd to them because, like, you know, we seem like the arse end of the universe here. But yeah, um, I'm here because my Irish, uh, uh, on my mother's side and English on my father's side, came here and, <clears throat> and that's why I'm here and I have mm. to just accept that. <laughs> well, keep, keep putting the work out, David, because it's really important Thank work. You. And I think for, for everyone uh, listening to the show, um, I think your greatest quality, like I said before we started, was your ability to break down um, seemingly very, very difficult topics into easy to understand language. And I think that is the definition of someone that really understands what they're talking about when they can teach it to someone that's just, just beginning. So I really appreciate you for the work you've done, David, and for talking today. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Thank you for chatting with me. Yeah, absolutely. We'll have to do it again. Okay. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. Great. Bye. Cool. Catch you later, mate. Bye. Hey guys, if you enjoyed the content, uh, you are more than welcome to click the link in the description below. That will take you right to a free webinar where I will be taking you exactly through how to design a framework for your life and create that mission that will bring about a sense of intrinsic value to you. Go for it.